So I'd like to start off. One second. Just started to record there. But first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for coming um, and welcome to our Zoom. We're going to talk about uh, laser optimization. Um, I've been traveling all over the country for years and years doing lasers for 15 years. And I see some offices just absolutely transform their practice with the lasers and some don't. So that's what we want to do is we kind of want to unleash the secret sauce and talk to some experts that have done it. And today we have Dr. Rohde uh, joining us. I'll be get to him in a second, but I just want to go over the ground rules that we're going to be doing today. So you'll all be muted. And if you have any questions, just go into the chat box and put in your question. And we're going to save that last 15, 10 minutes to field questions. Um, and I'd like to thank Fortune Management for sponsoring this. We've got Kevin Henry behind the scenes. He'll be um, taking in all those questions and get us to it at the end. So um, just hold your questions to the end. And then just to let you guys know, our goal today is if you have a laser to be able to walk away with some pearls that you can go back to your office and implement. And if you don't have a laser, um, get an unbiased opinion on what's out there and what can be done today. A lot has changed in the last few years. So we really want to focus on that and give you guys some pearls. And one thing that I did want to say is that today uh, is not going to be about clinical. I think clinical is critical. You need to have predictability with your laser. You need to have the confidence to do these things. But there are a lot of other sources for that information. Today is really about the business side. How do we take this technology and hockey stick it and help it on our business production? And what are the things that need to be done with you and your team to help with the business? However, if you guys do have some specific clinical questions, please put those in the chat box and we'll consider those. We're gonna be doing these every couple months. So if there's some common themes that we get, we'll do those in the future. So today we're gonna to focus on the business side. Mm -hmm. um, so that's important. So um, with that said, I'd like to uh, bring on Dr. Jeff Rohde. I'm just gonna look away for a second because his bio is quite long. Uh, Dr. Ro Rohde went to University of California at Los Angeles. So he got his undergrad in biochemistry and his doctorate in dental surgery. Um, he's also one of the first uh, laser users of the Solea technology on the West Coast, and for that matter, anywhere in the country. I think he's been using it during beta testing for almost seven years. Um, he is very familiar with technology. He's a co-founder of Dental Compare. He's a wet glove dentist in Santa Barbara. He's grown his practice tremendously. It's a beautiful practice, and we're going to talk about how he did that, and he is a CE guru. He, uh, he not only trains for convergent and does a lot of training with dentists, but he has completed his master program at Global Institute of Dental Education and UCL for surgical te techniques and implant surgery. So he's out there, he's doing a lot. So again, Dr. Rohde, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, man. It's always good hanging out with you, um, you know, and, and especially be able to share some time with uh, the rest of the folks. So thanks for having me on. You bet. And I uh, really appreciate uh, what you've done because you've really transformed your practice and I've seen tremendous things change with your practice and and you've really taken it to that next level and I wanted to go over with you on some of those things so I have a series of questions that I want to focus on today we're going to talk about new patients and attrition we'll talk about growth mm -hmm. and hygiene and pediatrics specifically I know that's really changing your practice and how the laser was a common denominator. But before we get into those topics, I wanted to ask you three questions. And sure. the first one is this, why did you buy a laser? What did you want it to do for you? Well, I think, I mean, to, to look at lasers in the first place, I think the initial draw, I mean, with Dental Compare, we had been looking at lasers for the last, I mean, Esther first started researching lasers for the site more than 15 years ago. Right, and, and the whole draw of lasers was it was supposed to do some kind of transformational change to our practice, right? It's either alters the way we're doing the clinical side, it alters the way that patients perceive what's happening there and it's changing the experience in a, in a parody culture where everyone thinks a filling is a filling is a filling, why would I go to you, right? And so to adopt laser technology, like any technology, the goal really was to, uh, I'm like, okay, we, we don't want to compromise the level of dentistry we do, but we do want to stand apart, you know, and we want to kind of distinguish ourselves among um, dentistry that's been done the same way for the last 35 years. I mean, you know, I've often said that 
I don't want to go to an oncologist that is doing 1982 oncology, right? And so, and not that there's not a lot of great dentistry being done based on good solid core principles, but my thing has always been, how do we incorporate the latest dentistry offers to give patients an unparalleled experience? And lasers just fit right into that. We just couldn't find the right one for a long time. Right. And so you want to differentiate yourself, which is really good because, you know, that's that's what our base wants. That's what patients want. The third most important things uh, we have Fred Joyle at 1-800 Dentist did a survey of over 22,000 patients. And the third most important thing to them was new technology. And that's a cherry on top if you can provide that wild experience. But what was one of the things that when you got the laser was the biggest surprise benefit that maybe you weren't expecting? I mean, honestly, I think the skeptical part of me was that it actually worked. So the, the laser we have is the, is the Celea CO2 all tissue laser. And it's like, anesthesia free. And we're like, I'll be the judge of that. You know? and, and I think the thing that was the most surprising was that um, it was fast, efficient, and it was anesthesia. I mean, it was reliably anesthesia free. So for, for the company to come out with this messaging and then have there be some integrity behind it. I, admittedly, the thing I was most surprised at is that it just, it worked, but it worked like mad. It was awesome, you know. Can you, can you maybe expand on that? Because Dr. Rode, see, and I work with a lot of dentists and, and a lot of the dentists on this call say, you know, I've heard this song and dance before. Uh, maybe yeah. it doesn't work for me. One of the things that I know is that laser technology is not harder, it's different. And mm -hmm. my experience has been when I coach doctors is you guys went to dental school, man, you could close your eyes and do a prep because you feel. And now we hand you this laser and we say, hey, it's non-contact, forget all that stuff and now do this. And I think it's like juggling. If you don't get one little technique thing right, it can kind of go a little south for you in regards to optimizing it. So maybe expand on kind of what your learning curve was with that and what you did to get to that, that level that you're at to be able to successfully do some of that anesthesia-free dentistry? Yeah, so I, I mean, and, and certainly the great thing too is that the laser itself has had a lot of great software updates. In early years, I would say the learning technology was more like three, four, five months because the software was different, the way the laser fired different. Um, you know, and now with the way the training has been restructured and, and there's, there's so much drawn into but here's what you need to know. It, what you said there about um, not harder, just different. Now we, we have so focused in on what's different that it's a lot easier to bring a user up to speed. So now it's like two to four weeks, not months and months and months and months. Really, then the integration part is how fast do you want to go? Right. You know? and it's, it's now limited by you, not by the, the technology or the awareness of it in a good way. It's like, man, if you're ready to charge, this machine works, you know? Yeah. I, I find uh, if you're committed to it, you really can make it happen. Um, let, yeah. Maybe some of the doctors that are on the phone, what, what could they expect, you know, in regards to anesthesia free dentistry is, you know, is it a hundred percent of the people that walk through the door, you're not numbing up, you know, maybe give them a feel for what can be accomplished. Yeah, so so for, on a scale of regular fillings, class yeah. one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, I mean, I would say we're ninety to ninety-five percent anesthesia free. We are absolutely not a hundred percent. You know, yeah. there's going to be that six-year-old that comes in with a hypoplastic molar that's super cold sensitive, and it's not the laser; it's the fact that there's water spraying to help cool and rinse the tooth. If you can't get the water on there, you can't necessarily laser. And in those cases, we might still numb up and use this non-vibrating whiny, uh, you know, like instead of the drill, you have, you have this laser. So the experience is still better. Um, but when someone comes in the door and they need a filling, I'm not sitting there going, okay, should I do numbing or we're doing the laser. I mean, that's, that, that is the first choice. Uh, barring someone basically saying, you know, I can't even get in past the first 10 seconds, you know? Um, so, and that's the predictability of it, you know? Yep. Um, it doesn't mean you can't use the laser on people with cold sensitivity in their teeth. I'm talking about the extreme examples of that, yep. um, you know? 
And, and I can't emphasize enough how profound what you just said is. When you consider dentistry is a tough market, man. I mean, 60% yeah. of the people do not go to the dentist out there because they're scared and they have anxiety. And what they have anxiety over is the shot or the drill. And if you can eliminate that, I can't, I can tell you from personal experience how profound that is to the patient and how that completely changes it. So that is very powerful to be able to do that. Right, right. And, and, and that's, that's kind of what has people coming back. We got into a discussion. We just hired a new hygienist. She's just out of school. She's fantastic. And I just asked her, I said, growing up, did you have a good hygienist, bad hygienist? What did you like about your hygienist growing up? And she's like, oh, she was great. She was really nice to me. And we, we always got along and I was friends with her daughter or whatever it is, right? It was not, oh, she used a Gracie curette with the blah, 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 and then did this medicament. Like people aren't necessarily paying attention to it. They want to know, they want to have the faith that you've done the research and the technology, and then they want to have a good experience, right? Yep. And that's, that's I, the fact that I use Panavia V5 for, to cement my crowns has nothing to do with the fact that we're, if they leave and they're like, gosh, they were so nice to me and nothing hurt. Yep. You know, I mean, that that's what changes the experience. And when you can predictably say anesthesia free for fillings, I mean, yep. forget all the other applications like crown lengthening and soft tissue. I mean, yep. just on that alone, when you can predictably say that, that's now a whole different level of messaging you're delivering. Yep. And to, to me, the thing that I've noticed is once you're able to do that, it really opens the door for enrollment and recare. They're not scared. They're not going to cancel because they know it's there. And it'll open the door for all those little things that need to be done that they tend not to do. And it just makes it simpler. And uh, we can talk more about that. So yeah. is that something that you've experienced as well? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like the, the we're going to watch that, right? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. no, we're going to laser that right now. You know, yep. um, you know, I'll give you an example. Of that is the classic, um, you know, little cheek bite fibroma. We go, oh, you know, this is really bothering me. This is, you know, before the laser. Oh, okay. So first thing we do is numb it up. And then I'm going to use a scalpel to create an elliptical incision and undercut this thing and then dig it out and then suture the ellipse back together again. You're going to be sore for about two weeks. You know, and they're like, pass. You know, they're, they're not going to accept the treatment because the onboarding to that treatment sounds horrific. And after that. And especially if a doctor, I mean, you talk about um, different, not harder. Mm -hmm. If a doctor hasn't done that before, I mean, here's the Salaya technique, right? You take that fibroma, you put a little tension on it, you cut it off at the base. There's no bleeding. The patient's healed in three or four days. Yep. That's it. There's, it's not even technique hard, right? Yep. And is that arguably better dentistry? Yes. And so people are just accepting, hey, you need all this stuff. And they're like, I'll give you a call that doesn't happen anymore. They, right. they schedule it, you know? Yep. When, we, when the patients don't have that underlying fear, they'll do it. And for you dentists out there that haven't experienced or maybe haven't had success, it is true. You can do not everything, but a lot of these things with just a good compound topical and same day mm -hmm. dentistry while they're in the chair. Mm -hmm. And you just do one or two of these a week. You're looking at, you know, that could be 70,000 to 100,000 just to your bottom line, just, just in that comment right there. Right. No, I think the first year we had it and we kind of didn't know, we weren't doing crown lengthening yet. The Salaya didn't have FDA approval for bones. We we're just doing little things like that. Um, I didn't even have training in soft tissue at the time. And we still posted $28,000 that year of just extra soft tissue stuff. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, well, that's not that, you know, big picture that's not that much well that was our payment right you know i mean <laughs> you know and that was the onboarding to doubling and tripling that every year after that right? yep. in in yep. terms of uh, adding that functionality it's it's the classic why are you referring stuff out when you can have a tool to do it in your office and potentially better yeah you know I, I i don't mean that we don't have a lot of great specialists that we work with i just mean that everything you cut with the laser categorically heals better and faster with less post-op sensitivity and yep. predictably, you know? Yep. 
And, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's, it's like an infant tongue tie or tongue tie in general. A lot of the dentists I talk to, they're like, yeah, you know, that's kind of a pucker factor procedure. You know, it's, you're nervous, <laughs> there's glands, you can get into all this sorts of trouble, but just coaching these, you do a couple times and it, it's six to eight, 20 seconds. And seconds. a lot of times it can be done with topical and you're like, no way until you do it. And then you start to see maybe there's 20, 30 procedures where, hey, patients will do these things. Once they have this restorative experience, they're like, yeah, I want to take that lump off my cheek. You know, and you yeah. can do it right there and there in a chair with topical and pa patients want that done. So um, great. What I was, agree. what was, what was one of the things that was some of your biggest challenges for that you experienced that, that, that you experienced when you integrated the laser? I would say, you know, it, overall is, and, and this is where I would say I kind of faltered in early days is getting buy-in from our team. You know, it, it like, our team, our, our team is so cohesive. They're great. And it's not that anyone meant it as a criticism, but it's kind of like, oh yeah, Jeff's got the, his laser. Th he's always bringing something home, you know, and yep. it, rather than now, for example, part of our onboarding is, so, so in other words, what happens then? someone's in a hygiene check, you know, or, or just not, they're not due for height. They're just with another staff member checking out at the front, getting their teeth cleaned and they go, Oh, what, what's, what's the deal with this laser or, you know, and, and they don't know what to say, or, um, they'll, they just won't hear about it. They just won't know we have it, right. you know, and which is even worse, you know, right. It's like the provider who does Invisalign, but doesn't ever market or tell anyone they do it. And then all their patients are coming in with Invisalign from all the other offices that do. Right. And so, the early mistake I would say we made is not having enough understanding and buy-in from the team. So yep. now part of our onboarding, like with this new hygienist I mentioned, I, it's, we, we sit down and we watch some of the clinical videos. We talk about patient experiences. We show some of the reviews online and said, this is what this machine does. I want you to know it. You don't have to field strip the thing, but you have to know what it does so that when someone asks you about it, I want you to be excited because it is exciting. You yeah. Know? Well, I'm glad you said that because that's one of the things, I mean, you know, I work with the largest consulting firm, dental consulting firm in the country, and now we have a whole division of laser mastery. It's because of what you just said, you know, someone can teach you how to do a phrenectomy, but there's not a lot of people. The other half of the equation is the team and mm. everybody needs to know, we need to have coherent messaging. We need to know what processes we have in place and how to communicate with our patients. Because once we do that, it's amazing what happens. And that's kind of the other half of the equation. So Excellent. Let me ask you this. Let's shift gears a little bit. And let's talk about a couple things specifically that, that I know you've experienced. And I, and I think the common denominator was the laser on some of these. And let's talk about new patient acquisition, kind of pre-laser, post-laser, what mm -hmm. you found in your practice. Yeah, so, I, it, so it has been a little over seven years. So it was March 2014, I did my first training with, with the laser. And um, <clears throat> admittedly, I, I, I may, I think I've told you this story Nick, a few times, but we didn't do any marketing for the first five to six months because I wasn't sure it worked. <laughs> and then it did. And then we didn't do marketing after that because we we're like, oh my gosh, this is the best kept secret in dentistry. We don't want the rest of our town to know about it, you know? Um, so as far as new patients, really what we saw is kind of a grassroots roots growth. Um, you know, the, the old tried and true word of mouth. Um, and we're hovering around 25 to 30 new patients a month to by the end of that year, we're hitting 80 something new patients a month um, to, you know, and then of course you add those patients, now you add got to add more hygiene, you know, um, and just slowly kind of stair-stepped up. Um, we are at about 120, 125 new patients a month when we finally dropped Delta as a provider, one of our last larger holdouts because of the things that were difficulties with them. Um, and one of the weirdest things is the new patients kept coming. We thought, oh, good. We're so busy seeing these new patients. We're going to drop Delta and maybe that'll slow the roll a little bit. And, then, <laughs> and the, the patients weren't leaving. You know, they, they were like, well, no one else on this list has the laser, so I, I, I'm not, 
you know, and, and I'll be quick to say too, and where your talents are in it, because you know, it's not just a laser, it's all of it. It's how right. your team approaches things. It's how the right. phone's being answered. It's what they experience when they walk in. Fred Joel's yep. book, everything is marketing, right? It's all important, but it's such a powerful story, yep. you know, to say that and that. So people weren't leaving. And I mean, this year we, we were still breaking records. We're in the middle of a pandemic and we, we've now brought in another doctor in April and he's full time now and we need another one. You know, there's just... There's just this um, really neat excitement that comes from that. Yep. Yeah. And I mean, that's one of the things why I'm so passionate about it, because lasers can do two things. And it's not that I'm a laser lover. I love what it can do for dentistry. It really does transform the patient of, of one of fear, their experience from one of fear to one of gratitude. And it's transformational mm -hmm. to the practice when you do it right. And these aren't just fluff stories that there's three dentists in the country like you and three others that have done it, I see it time and time again. And a lot of dentists are like, gosh, I wish I could, you know, increase production five, 10% this year. When I see these guys that implement these lasers, I mean, they're having collections and production increases 30% year after year after year. Um, every year. That. Every year. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, and I know life, new patients is the lifeblood of a practice, but a lot of, one of the things that a lot of doctors don't look at is attrition. What's going on at your back door? How many patients are you mm. losing? And, you know, if you, you, you can't manage if you can't measure. So for you guys out there, I think that's one thing you really need to take a close look at. Can you maybe talk about what you found, not only what you gained, but what, how patients were leaving the practice and what happened. Yeah, well, our so one of the measurements that we did, because sometimes it's hard to track, right? So we have Dentrix, we went to the continuing care list, and we looked at who's overdue in the, just one year um, in terms of people we weren't getting in. And yep. we printed out like 42 pages single space to patients that were overdue for some reason or another. So we started calling through that. I think there's better ways to do that now, like Dental Intel has some good tools for that. You guys are obviously have much better tips than I could give. It's, but there's there's ways to start looking at who is overdue and who's not coming in. Mm -hmm. um, and we kind of massage the list by hand, and we're like, you know, we're, there's definitely people move, people, you know. So what you know what we actually ended up doing was uh, running a survey. Um, and, and it was an independent survey where we sent people a, um, a email and it asked all these questions. What do you what do you think of their technology? How is their customer service level? How was your last visit with their hygienist? Have have you ever experienced the Saleo laser? And, and and one of the questions on there was, you know, well, did are you planning on making a change to another office for whatever reason? Insurance? I'm moving. I don't like you guys. You don't have enough of the hot towels thing. I'm moving to another practice. And the, the last I heard was the average, the national averages for practice is about 12%. And if you had asked me what the number would be from that survey we ran, and we had over 600 something responses, which for our patient population is pretty good. Mm -hmm. But if you had asked me what it was, it'd be like, well, it's zero. I mean, we, I mean for all you doctors listening, wouldn't you say it's zero? Because you guys work hard and you're awesome and you're doing your best for your patients. But as you know, that patient population can, you know, they, they have their own, you know, lives, their own mind, their own way of doing things. And, and our numbers came back 12%. I mean, we were right there. At, the attrition from our practice is right there with everyone else. We were losing 12% a year. Um, but what the company said, at the time was, well, did you notice one of these trends though is a little different. If we sort out for anyone who experienced Celea, the attrition weight went to zero. Like, so in other words, had you seen or experienced or been told of the laser and know this technology is there, none of those people were leaving. So it dropped our attrition rate from 12%, which is like a lot of, pe <laughs> a lot of people back down to to zero just from experience in this technology and and that correlated a lot with what we were seeing with people when we 
we'd have people come in like, oh, I, hear, I heard you have this laser. And I'm like, yeah, we have this laser. It's awesome. Okay, let's look at your teeth, new patient. Yep. And then I step back and I go, gosh, your teeth are perfect. Did, you know, I noticed you were asking about the laser. What did someone else tell you you had decay? Yep. And, and they're like, no, I just want to be where this technology is. So if I ever need it, I'm in the right spot to begin with. Right. Yep. And when they have that experience, they're not going to cancel their hygiene. They're not going to do these things. And so for you guys right. out there listening, um, please just don't get laser focused on new patients. Be looking at your active patient count. And we define active patient as have they seen you and been active in the last 18 months? And then get that list and, and dig into it and find where you're at. Because, man, it can really help and make a big difference there as well. Pay right. attention to those patients. Um, and, and let's, let's shift gears now and talk a little bit about, um, hygiene, um, and what it meant to your hygiene department. We know at fortune working with thousands of office for, for every dollar that's generated in hygiene, that'll be $2 of production over the course of the year that you generate. So, you know, when those numbers go up, it's logically what's going to happen to the bottom line, but share a little bit about, you know, what you think the laser brought to your hygiene department, and how it grew. Well, I think it's it's kind of what you're saying. I, I just go back to your your thoughts on that new patient who's experienced that, mm -hmm. and then they know the kind of technology that's that's going on there. They're more likely to make a recall appointment and and stick with it. Um, certainly, one of the strategies we have, and I can't remember where we picked up, is no one leaves without an appointment. You know, I mean, every everyone needs to have an appointment for something. You know. Mm -hmm. um, at the very minimum, a recall appointment. Um, but it creates kind of an energy and excitement of like, oh, this, oh gosh, here, here I gotta go again. I gotta, you know, walk past the, you know, the doldrums of the front desk to get into this thing, to have them get these iron hooks out to scrape my teeth. And it's like, it changes the whole environment. Like, we, we ha I mean, we legitimately have, and I'm sure you, the other doctors do too, but legitimately have people who are like, I was excited to come in today, you know, for my, for my teeth cleaning. Um, and again, to that point is, is then you're encouraging them. You're not shaming them, you know, with their hygiene, you know, it's little things like that, that, you know, rather than telling them how bad they are, you know, encourage them with a few tools, how well they could be doing. Um, and then getting them getting them going again, and and for us, what what the result of that was, we went from two hygienists on Monday and one a day, the rest of the week, to we have four hygienists a day every day now, and um, we are rounding out this new hygienist just because we had someone who was on maternity leave and didn't want to come back for the full thing, so we added another day with her. So, but. It, it's like, yeah, I, like, I love what you said, Nick, because it's like, don't forget to take care of the people who are still there. That is, those are the people who are going to be with you for 20 years are the people who are going to be the foundational part of your practice. And they may not need a crown this year, but they're going to need three next year. So let's take care of them. Let's make the right choices, health choices, ethical choices for them every step of the way. Have them know that, have them feel that, have them replicated from that with the hygienist. And then they're going to know they're in a safe place, a place with good technology, pa patient for life. That's, that's our goal, right? I mean, yeah. and, and it all boils down to communication. And I really think there's two things in the hygiene department that are important. And you're talking about the relationship, but it's two things. One, the value of dentistry from a systemic link perspective and to keeping good oral health and to keep them in their recare uh, program. Yes. But the other thing that hygienists ha are very powerful is I call it co-discovery. They're the eyes and ears of the practice. They're the ones that are seen in, in the mouth every day. And when they understand what can be done with the laser, you know, they can make comments like, you know, hey, you've got this little operculum back there and it's kind of a breeding ground for bacteria and it's going to be a future cavity. You know, the laser Dr. Rody used on you where we didn't have to numb you up. If you got five minutes, we can put some top claw on that and he, he probably can make some time. And when they do that, patients say yes. Half the patients don't like their smiles. If the biggest, the biggest marketing mm -hmm. tool you guys can have out there and listening is an intraoral camera. Show them it. <laughs> 
let them know this is what I do if it's my daughter. And when they have a good experience, believe me, they will say yes to these things. And I'm sure you've seen some of that. Oh, absolutely. And and the co-diagnosis part is 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 there. I mean, you know, what where we try to again is establish that trust. We have a lot of patients who, you know, they were seeing um one of the senior partners in our practice, he's slowly kind of stepped back. Now they're seeing me, but they've seen the same hygienist. And if she says, this is the way it needs to be. That's that there's a trust relationship because they've been cleaning the teeth for so long. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're spending more time. You know, they're, there's a, they're spending 45, 50 minutes in the room versus my laser film that takes three minutes or the perculectomy you mentioned was like 30 seconds. I mean, mm-hmm. um, so yes, we absolutely rely on, I want to walk in the door and all the decisions are already made. I'm just, you know, checking the box, you know. Yeah, we call that bobblehead dentistry where you're just in there going, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> and that doesn't just happen. It takes uh, a lot of work, you know, to get, hy- hygienists need to look at their department as a subdivision of your business and they're in charge of it. And what we're talking about now, it sounds simple, but there's a lot of processes and communication that it needs needs to happen but man when they do it it's it's amazing what happens in those hygiene departments oh yeah in fact i i uh, I, right along with what you're saying what we've kind of done is is go is treat them more like associates rather than like just go in the corner and stop bothering me it's like you are one of the clinicians you're a provider what program Nick standing right in front of you, what program is going to help him be healthy that we're going to look back in 20 years? Okay, so do that, run that. You want four months? I'll back you up, you know, instead of six months, four month recall. It's letting them be the provider so that if they then go like, I'm going to have a better time cleaning your teeth, I'm going to recommend orthodontics with Invisalign. Yeah. You know, hey, there's there, you know, there's the operculectomy situation blocking you from properly cleaning those back molars i'm going to recommend like this is going to help me keep you healthy better you know mm-hmm. and so we that's why we we let them like you hey run your program but to your point we've already synced up on what that program looks like we're not trying to offer dentistry people don't need we're not giving them weird kickbacks we're like just take care of these people but empower them to have the independence to make those decisions and yep. they've always responded better than just get in there and do what I'm telling you to do, yep. you know, you know, just across the board. Yeah. And for you guys out there that are listening and, and spending a few years now do uh, practice management consulting, I can tell you that one of the biggest barometers you can tell on a practice is your recare reactivation rate and hygiene. It, it's kind of the lifeblood of how you're doing. And one of the things that we found at the Rodeo all over the country is that on average in the U S the recare rates, it's about 35%. I mean, think about that. So we only got 35% of our base active co- patients coming back for recare. That means that 60 or 55% or 60% don't value our service. You know, our recare and our hmm. reactivation rate should be 80% or higher because then, then that's where the laser can help with that wow experience. You take those, that anxiety, that fear, and then, you, you know, with some communication, they're, they're going to come in on a regular basis. They're not going to cancel on you and think a haircut's more important, you know, or whatever the case may be. So for you guys out there, I'd take a look at what is your reactivation rate? What's your recare rate? You know, if it's 35%, that's pretty darn average, you know, and if you really want to make a difference in your practice, that yeah, that's a great place to start. So no, I love that. Love that. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, I want to talk about pediatrics because one of the things with the laser is for, for you guys out there that are new to lasers is obviously pediatric teeth, the primary teeth have more water in it. It's a little easier to cut with the laser and man with the kids, it's all between the ears. And, and I've found that when I'm coaching a, a doctor on how to use a laser, it's more profound with kids and it really works amazingly with kids um, as well. So Talk to me a little bit about, you know, what you found with pediatrics in your practice and, and kind of what you've done and the difference now that, that you have toward working with kids. Well, stepping back one thing, you were asking earlier about like how and when do we choose to use a laser? And it's like, oh, 90 to 95% of our patients. 
that number with with kids is 99.9. I mean, they really have to have some like big broken open tooth not to work. In fact, it's so predictable that if 10 seconds in the lasering, a, a child's like, oh, it's hurting. Like, it, it's not that we're not compassionate to that. It's just, I'm in my mind, I'm going, no, it's not. And it, it, it is not hurting. And, and, and then you kind of work past it and you know how you can check on different spots of the tooth and they're like, okay, you're just making this up. Um, but it's so predictable. It's so predictable that, I mean, we haven't had to numb a child up for a traditional filling in that seven years time. Um, now, sometimes kids need a lot more than just straightforward fillings, right? You might have two, three teeth that are just bombed out. They need extraction, space maintainers, um, you know, things like that. And that's where, uh, we have, uh, you know, we eventually just brought in a pediatric specialist to help with that. But for using that on little fibromethines, mucosils, operculectomies, phrenectomies, shaping tissue, hyperplastic tissue for orthodontic cases. I mean, if you're remotely seeing kiddos, yeah, I don't, um, uninterrupted teeth with eruption cysts, we're lasering those out. I mean, this is the best pediatric tool, hands down, that you could possibly get for your practice. I mean, there's no question for that. I mean, so much so that we ended up having to hire a pediatric specialist to help with all the work. Yep. You know, um, but it's it's absolutely valuable. Yep. Well, and that's one of the things that we coach is, I mean, if you think about back to my other statement, and this can be in regards, Dr. Rody, to any specialist. If half the people are nervous and they don't go to the dentist, here's another stat. 80%, 82% of the people that walk through your door are nervous. So the last thing that they want to do is be referred out. It took enough courage mm -hmm. to come to you and they have a relationship with you. The more you can do or you can bring under your roof, the more your patients are going to value that. So no matter what that is. So even if it's oral surgery or orthodontics, the more that you can have under your roof, the more successful you're going to be. I mean, look what DSOs are doing. <laughs> I mean, right. they're going by the book of what patients are demanding right now. And they have all those specialists under the roof. They're not doing it for giggles. They're doing it because they know it's hard to get them to come to one door, let alone two. And so right. the more that you can do, and then it, it just really explodes. And, you know, now that you, you know, and I think you've probably experienced that. Yeah, no, I mean, and that's where a lot, I mean, let's, let's kind of bring in many of those questions you've had along the way. Let's bring up new patients, right? So, you know, there's a pickup at the school, carpool is getting ready to go. And they're talking about, oh my gosh, my son had the worst visit. Oh, well, we went and saw Dr. Rody. He used this laser. It's awesome. And so then that family comes in, they watch it happen. Um, and then all of a sudden, the entire family of five is coming in the door, right? Yeah. Um, you know, and, and that's where, uh, that's where the, the whole idea of this specialist that the laser kind of allows you to sort of be, I wouldn't even say jack of all trades. It's not like we don't refer someone out, but it's kind of the renaissance dentist where you're sort of doing more and more and more for your own practice. Because in one case, it might be pedo, which leads to the family seeing what's going on with Johnny. And then they all come. And then dad needs a crown who also needs crown lengthening. And we're doing the crown lengthening with the laser. Yep. You know, so there's very few things other than like third molars or complex molar endo that we're even referring anymore. Again, not that we don't have amazing specialists and partners that we work with we send them work all the time right um but you can't ask it what you said about not wanting to go really I have to go somewhere else you guys don't do that i hear for those cases where you refer out 98 percent, i hear that yep really i have to go somewhere else? like yeah that well, we don't really do number 15 endo yeah <laughs> you know and, and they're like okay you know um Yep. So if you can do those or have specialists to do it, and again, guys, for some of you that don't have the technology, you may think, well, I don't like surgery. Believe me, to me, that's the exciting part of the laser. I don't, I wouldn't like surgery either done the traditional way, but when you can do it and you don't have, you know, blushing blood all over and worried about hemostasis and pain and aching, and you can clean, see clearly what you're doing. And it's almost like 
it's it reminds me of butter melting away when you can clearly see mm -hmm. what's going on and you're like i just did that with topical then the doctors get excited about yeah i'll do those when when it's predictable like that and and it's one of those things that you really find that you grow into yeah no we I, I know you and I've talked about the amount of CDT codes we could do with this laser. I think at one point we came up with 88 different CDT codes, four of which are one, two, three, four surface composites. So there's 84 at least CDT codes of stuff you could do. And to your point, that's probably, we weren't a surgery office. I mean, we were getting into placing implants, but we weren't like a surgical office. And now those other 84 CDT codes are like the most exciting part of the day. And it comes back to, again, what we talked about at the beginning is this technology makes onboarding easy because of the fact that, like you said, with the butter, you cut it, it's like butter, it's done, it's not bleeding, that's it. You know, yep. I mean, it's, it's so much of an easy, a better tool. Right. And I, one of the dentists I used to have in Las Vegas, Cal Evans said, Nick, I used to be a watch adonist. I just watched everything. <laughs> and he, he goes, I can tell you this in dentistry, nothing better gets better over time. It's only going to get worse. And there's a phrase for it. It's called the cycle of neglect. We just, well, let's watch it. Well, why don't we get it early when it's easier and cheaper and not painful? Why are we letting it wait till it becomes a bigger deal? And a lot of these things, guys, are the lays that the laser can do really good. Um, Jeff, I want to take one step back because I want to talk a little bit more at detail, and I know this isn't a clinical conversation. We're getting to the end, but I think I have a feeling what a lot of the potential laser owners and maybe existing would say, well, my patients, my kids feel it, and I'm not at 100%. And one of the things that I can tell everybody out there is I just want to make two things clear. Kids will feel something, but it's not going to hurt. And a lot of times when they feel cold or feel something, they freak out and we've got to get, you know, your security blanket of anesthesia is kind of gone. And it's kind of a learning curve that you need to go through, not only the psychology of it, but also when the kids start to feel a little something, there's things that we can teach and coach them how to get over that. So my analogy is a bumpy landing on an airplane. I, I see a lot of dentists, they have it for the first week and the kid cries and they had a bumpy landing and they parked their new jet and they don't bring it out again. You just need to learn how to do that. And that's where that people like yourself and myself, we really want to help these guys get over that. So maybe talk a little bit about kind of pre, I think another big thing with kids is pre-framing mom and dad and the kid uh, before they even get in there about, hey, you know, this is what to expect. So maybe talk a little bit about that um, because it's one thing to say, yeah, I'm at 99%. But then you got someone out there going, not my office, right? You know, maybe right. help them a little bit with that because that is the foundation for a lot of the stuff that we're talking about. Yeah, I mean, I mean, so much of it does come down to what you say, and I've picked up some good little nuggets from you, Nick, on on just like little things to say. Um, you know, you guys have all, you know, sometimes we use the example of you have a temporary crown, you take the temporary crown off, you're going to cement the lab crown on and you don't necessarily numb it up, but they're going to feel something, right? And so you go, oh, hey, you should, you might feel a little cold here and there, but you know, I'll get this crown on there and you, maybe they do okay. And a lot of times that you can get away with that. The, and, and it turns out, I, I think the reason I love your question is this is probably one of the most important techniques of laser dentistry is not saying, hey, guess what? It's going to feel like white fluffy clouds passing over your tooth. And, you know, I tell people all the time, for example, for adults, you are going to feel something. You might um, feel a little tingling in the tooth. You might feel cold because there's water washing across the tooth and that's okay. And that's one of those ones I picked up from you too, is like, and that's okay. You're establishing one, you're going to feel, it's not going to be zero. And we know it and you're going to be okay. And that's okay. It's expected, right? Yep. Um, and then I say, please, you know, if you need to pause for any reason, let me know and, and raise your hand and we'll pause. I don't say, and by the way, if it starts to hurt, give me a holler because I'm, you know, because you don't want to put in their head that it's going to necessarily hurt, right? 
Right. With kids, it's a little different because that's that's a lot of convoluted concepts, right? Um, and so for kids, I really break it down easy. Like I go, okay, you're going to feel some water washing the sugar bugs away. Here, let me turn on the laser so you can see the water. And when you first turn on the laser, there's a little mist coming out and it, as it's priming the, the pump on the laser for the mist. And I have them put their fingers in it just to feel it. You go, yeah, see how it feels cold? Yeah, so that's going to be washing the sugar bugs away and you're going to feel a little cold in the tooth. And, um, and then once you activate the laser, there's a green aiming beam that comes out and we'll go like, yeah, and show them the green aiming beam. Okay, there's the laser. Let's go. Yep. And, and, and then you have to, uh, sorry, real quick, the, the, the other thing is time. I go, okay, I need 30 seconds to work on your tooth because the longer you have good constant energy on the tooth, the more predictably you'll have this analgesic effect happen that actually gets the tooth to be more comfortable. So I don't want to hear about what they did last weekend. I mean, I do, but once I start the laser stuff, I go, I'm going to count to 30. And when I'm done, we'll check in, see how you're doing. But I need to get to 30 to make sure the sugar bugs don't escape or whatever. You know. And then we get 30 solid seconds in. And then that is more comfortable on the tooth. You yeah. know? So for you guys out there that are listening and maybe haven't had success or you had a college roommate that had a bad experience with lasers, one of the things that I can say is it boils down to two things. One, pre-faming the patient conversation. And two is for it's no reason no fault of anybody's but for whatever reason your technique or your settings or something's just a little off or you just need a few tips on when you reach that sensitive area how to deal with it and you never got over it you kind of parked it and don't let that happen to yourself you have a great tool and it's fixable and that's mm -hmm. why we started this whole thing is, is for guys like you and me to be able to help with that because you see the results and when you get through it I love it when doctors have that aha moment and can do what you're saying because you're that close you just don't know it and you and i've coached enough guys de dentists out there to know that that's the case yeah it's that last little speed bump of yep. being a little uncomfortable and then once you're on the other side you're flying you know? right so for you guys out there don't don't accept that hey i'm flipping a coin and 50 you, percent you you don't realize how close you are to being where dr roadie's at and just just commit to that because it can get there and when you do that the results are just unbelievable so um, what I want to do now is I'm gonna we're, we're running we've got about 10 minutes left and I just got a ping from Kevin and he mentioned there's there's a some questions out there that we wanted to hit so Kevin if, if you're out there if you could kind yep. of bear witness and uh, kind of let us know some of the, the questions that some of our participants have for Dr. Rohde. Absolutely. Good talk tonight, gents. Uh, Dr. Rohde, let's talk a little bit about removing old amalgams. That's a question that came through on the chat. Uh, is there sure. any, uh, anything you can talk about with that? Yeah. So, so if it's, so we, we started to talk about with the kids uh, techniques right at the end there, but as, as the, the laser applies energy to the tooth, it's actually pulsing about 1100 times a second. And those micro vibrations actually create um, an analgesic effect. I mean, it's in other words, it, it kind of overwhelms the pulp tissue so much that it kind of shuts the nerves off. So then if you have this sideways painful stimulus coming in, it doesn't hurt. So our, in other words, the longer you're lasering on the tooth, the more comfortable the whole process gets. It's crazy. So with amalgams, you basically start in an area of leakage and you start troughing around there. I'll get 45, 60 seconds of cleaning it out. A lot of times I can just flake the amalgam out and, and, that, and then I'm done. And then you're mopping up the decay or, you know, like debris with the laser. Um, but with a good analgesic effect, I can actually go in there with another tool like a drill. And it, it, back to the, again, the prepping the patient, I go, listen, it's going to vibrate like crazy. You're going from hovering a laser 10 millimeters off the tooth to applying a drill, you're going to notice the vibration. And so we just kind of warn people that, hey, I'll let you know when I get to that part. Now, and then I'll say, okay, here's that part where I'm going to break up the amalgam a little bit. And honestly, it's not that patients are sitting there the whole time waiting for it to hurt. They're waiting for you to tell them in a lot of ways. I mean, this is the coaching that I always got from Nicholas. It's like, don't predict pain into their experience do you know do all these things and then they don't know if the, it's they just you know 
it's it's like they're waiting for you to acknowledge something is is hurting and so when we go in there then i'll break up the amalgam into bigger chunks get all those out of there and then mop up again mop up with the laser and, and that's it yeah um, and just to just to expand on that jeff a couple of things because you know you've been doing this a long time and i remember when i started helping um convergent three four years ago the first couple software iterations i would tell dennis don't even try an amalgam but now with like you mentioned it earlier with the software upgrades use mm -hmm. the laser to take out the mechanical retention and then if you get one of those brassler flat burrs to take out all the amalgam because guys out there you can't you can't aim the laser at the amalgam you get mercury no. vapor and whatnot yeah all you're doing all dr Rody's talking about doing is taking out the mechanical retention takes about 30 45 seconds and then use that flat burr to get out the amalgam and with these new software settings i'm amazed how great it works right right and and in that case you know the, i mean in full disclosure the caveat that goes with that is if you can barely see two little cusps on either side of the tooth sticking out and it's just this massive MODBL amalgam. And so we've actually done that where we, I have a video and it's like 12 minutes long. And it's like, I laser got the analgesic effect and drilled some out. Laser smart, drilled some out. Laser smart, drilled some out. When guys, the reality is that should probably just be a prep anyway. Like that should probably be a crown. There's not enough tooth structure left. Yeah. So use your own clinical judgment on that, but can you do it? Absolutely. You know, yeah. it's just, I don't want, I don't want this tool to slow you down either. You know? Yeah. All right. All right. You, 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 you mentioned crowns. Uh, you mentioned crown lengthening. Can you complete the same day with a CEREC crown? And if so, how do you manage the insurance billing? Ah, <laughs> so, so, Two parts of that question is the, sorry, I'm getting a little sunshine in here. I'll try to um, avoid that. Um, so two parts of that. Um, one is the, uh, maybe if I shift over here, one is the clinical side. Okay, this clinical side is, can you do crown lengthening? Oh my gosh, that's my one of my favorite things to do with this is absolutely it can remove tissue and bone for better margins around a crown. So part one, or part A, part B is that you're you're healed within a few days, not six to eight weeks, right? I mean, this the it's categorically heals faster than any traditional way where you're taking a round burr with tissue flopped all over the place, you know, um, you know, and and so that's the clinical side. Yes, you can, and there is flapless and non-flap, you know, flapless and flap techniques to do that. Um, the second question then is the insurance. Yes, your insurance or their, that patient's insurance will pay Dr. Claussen across the street to do the, the periodontist say to do the procedure. And then they come over to you to do the crown and they will pay everybody the full thing. And if you do the crown, depending on the insurance, this isn't every insurance, but depending on the insurance, they might actually say, um, you know, like, oh, well, that was tissue preparation. So we're not going to cover, you know, the insurance won't necessarily cover that. And so our, our workaround for that is because we have a few doctors here, it might be, um, you know, even though I can do it, I mean, the, you think about what's the best we can offer a patient clinically? How about do the crown lengthening right then and there, and then maybe put a zirconia crown with good tissue adaptation. That's better than any temp, right? But you're right, insurance sometimes handcuffs us. So either have another clinician in your office do it or literally do it the next day. Make your zirconia crown, put it on there. That's the best temp you have. Let them heal for a week, come back and just exchange the cement with something stronger, build the crown out at that point. Um, you know, so another is but do it a week apart. But here's the here's the best part about it. You're not doing that eight weeks from now. You're doing you, you do it on a Monday. I'm doing I'm cementing on a Thursday. Right, it's that predictable of healing um, that you don't have to wait that same amount of time, depending on what you're doing. Yeah. So, but unfortunately, yes, that is the handcuffing of the insurance in this case is the quote tissue preparation. And and I, I'd like to just add a little bit to that, Jeff, in regards to Part A, the clinical side of it, for you doctors mm -hmm. out there, just know that this is minimally invasive. Like. When we're doing a lot of this, we just need a window of access. So when you think of this, don't think of the traditional 
flap and what you're doing. And even if you're interproximal and you need to flap, it's almost more like an access window. It's not this big full thickness flap that we're dealing with. You just need to see what you're doing. And it's amazing how the patients heal. I'll never forget a couple of years ago, we we're out at LVI and we were doing a, a case like this and there was an oral surgeon there. And he's like, you know, hey, I don't get this. I'm great at this. I just timed this. The laser, it, it took, you know, you 16 minutes and we had to do the exact same thing on the other side. And so on the other side, we used a scalpel and a drill and traditional, you know, the traditional way. And he's like, see, that took three minutes less. And I go, well, you'll be here tomorrow, right? <laughs> and the patient came back the next day and she had the exact same thing done. And one with the laser, one traditional. And she said, I could feel my heartbeat all night over here. I couldn't sleep. I'm aching and I felt nothing over here. And I told the oral surgeon, I said, that's what it's about. I know cold steel can do some of these things, but it can do it so much more conservatively. And then on part B of this is the insurance game, unfortunately, that we have to play. And it's mm -hmm. Dr. Rohde's right. It's different by state. And I don't know if you can do it in California. I've heard some doctors say if they have two associates, one does comes in and does the surgical side and one places the crown. And that's like being on the other side of the street. But unfortunately, you have to play those games because the insurance hasn't caught up with the technology and what we can do with it. Yeah, but gang, to, to his point, it's not just that back molar you were bringing, you were at LVI, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the aesthetic crown lengthening potential. I mean, yeah. we've, taken, we've taken cases that are like, you know, not the most ideal crown height, but we, oh gosh, do we want to put someone through this really tough aesthetic crown lengthening two and a half months from now, finally jumpstart the case. You guys, this is like, like what you're talking about, Nick, is that, you know, you know, every, every, every veneer case you do, do yourself a favor of looking at the gingival contours. And now with this laser, you have an opportunity to, to restructure all that. It's more like crown lengthening to your point about a couple of techniques. Crown lengthening is more like festooning. It's more like shaping yes. sculpting gums than it is cutting, right? Yep. It's, this is more like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mold the gums to the shape that I want. And this is good everywhere in the mouth, not even in critical aesthetic places that you would cover at LVI. You know? Right. And I mean, th I, I've been to Nash and Hornbrook and you go to all these aesthetic courses. And I mean, think about it. You can go in there and, and for guys that are doing this, that you're doing these large cases, get yourself, it's called a chew gauge, C-H-U, chew gauge. And what it does is it takes the width of the tooth and based on Fibonacci or the golden proportions, tells you exactly where you should be at each tooth. Because how many times do we compromise a gingival height because we've invaded biological width? They're spending all this money on this case. Now what Dr. Rohde's saying is, hey, you can go in and create the biological width with the laser. And the patient doesn't mm -hmm. even hurt. Now there's free attached tissue and there's some rules that we need to abide by and look out for, but man, you can make your aesthetic cases geometrically perfect with the laser. Yep, yep, and and how you're talking about little techniques, I mean, just slipping the laser just under the gums in the anterior to just remove a little bone for that biologic width. I mean, you know, the, the other thing too is you're cutting without heat. So when you do this with a diet, again, laser is not a laser is not a laser, right? You do this with a diode laser, you're cutting with a lot more heat. So you get the unpredictability of kind of cooking the tissue potential for recession, you know, more post-op, you know, my face is throbbing kind of thing. And with this, you don't, with this kind of laser, you, you, you have almost none of that because it's, it's not, it's ablating, not charring. Right, it's just you, you, different. Your, your thermal necrosis is almost zero. Yes. When you know how to use this, you eliminate that that trauma and edema. It's just not there, and patients have a completely different experience. And healing Absolutely. is completely different. Um, it heals so quick; it's amazing. Yeah, that's why. Um, and Kevin, uh, sorry, we're we'll back to the questions, but we were talking about all the other things other than fillings. You know. This is the stuff that's the most exciting because I, I really do believe that, that with lasers in your practice, you're utilizing a tool that's categorically better than anything else we have out there with better post-op comfort, with better healing. Like yeah. it's, it becomes a no-brainer that way. Yeah, there's no question that it's really, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a jack of all trades. It's like that Swiss army knife, but on top of it, 
it's the most conservative thing we can do. It's truly micro dentistry. Uh, we can mm -hmm. do a lot more with just topical and it creates, it makes things easier and faster for the dentist, but we get that side benefit of having a better patient experience because they don't have all this inflammation and swelling and, you know, edema that we're Absolutely. talking about. Yeah. All right, Kevin, what else do we have for questions? We're at time. That's all we've got. So uh, maybe Jeff could give some contact information for anybody who'd like to follow up afterwards. Yeah, so um, um, I, I wasn't sure if it was already on the registration, but um, without a formal slide to put up, um, you can email me at my email address if you have more questions, especially on the management side, which was kind of the point of uh, Nick's talk today, but also on the clinical side. Um, my email is my name, J for Jeff, Rohde, R-O-H-D-E, so J-R-O-H-D-E at sbdds.com like santa barbara dentist.com so uh, please reach out I'd love to continue the conversation i know zoom is tough sometimes and i know it's hard when we're trying to cover so many topics um but uh definitely what i would encourage you to is check back in with um uh with nick as part of his regular series because the amount you're just scratching the surface with these he's so knowledgeable about just practice and um, more than most dentists I know. So um, definitely plan on coming back and joining in with him um, over the coming months. Well, thanks for that, Jeff. And thanks for joining us. I really appreciate your wealth of knowledge and you, your success clinically has led to success from your practice and your team and, and you deserve it. And, and I really love that. I want more people to have it. And you talked about a series for, for everybody out there. We're having, we're, I plan on doing one of these every couple months and I wanna bring in people like Dr. Rohde that have just killed it. And we're gonna bring in Dr. Tim Anderson and he's in North Dakota. And it is amazing what he's done with the laser as a common denominator on social media. Same thing, growing his practice, doing all sorts of amazing things. And so if you guys have anything, put it in the chat. Um, we'll reach out to you, recap. If you wanna talk to me, we'll send you invites for the other ones. Um, if we get a common trend, we'll have that in the future and, and, and try to help you guys out to get to the level that you deserve. You invested in this technology or if you're considering it, I think you really need to know what can be done and, and you guys deserve it and the patients deserve it. So I appreciate your time and thanks again, Jeff. Thank you. It's been great. All right. Thanks, guys. Look forward to talking with you soon. Thanks, Kevin.